So we're moving on to chapter four. <clears throat> we're going to be talking about health services professionals. So this is a, these are the, you know, uh, we've been talking a lot about the environment. We've kind of casually talked about some of the actors in the marketplace, in the healthcare market. So we're going to kind of go into some detail uh, about the people, you know, who make healthcare happen. So kind of broadly, this is a, a laundry list of the kind of people we'll talk about today in this briefing. Uh, these slides are up on, on Canvas. Uh, you should be able to grab them if you want. Um, so we'll talk about physicians because obviously they are uh, central to our story, uh, but we'll talk about kind of, your book now refers to them as non-physician. Uh, I I'm kind of grew up calling them uh, mid-level providers. So these are P PAs and uh, nurse practitioners primarily. They are uh, PA, so PA, well, we'll talk about, uh, we'll talk about nurses, pharmacists, dentists kind of, kind of lump together a whole field called allied health um, that, uh, and I break them out into those that have licenses to practice independently. So that's our, our future OT folks, our future nutritionists, right? You fit into that allied health licensed independent provider. And then we have allied health other. These are people who are not, who are skilled. Uh, so some of you might be, I don't know, is anybody in laboratory technology here? No. Okay, so laboratory technology, a laboratory technologist is a four-year degree, um, and they are, these are the people that kind of lead hospital labs um, under the oversight of a physician, um, you know, pathologist typically is a, is a laboratory-based um, uh, physician. So we'll talk about different kinds of physicians. Uh, and then administrators, the coolest, best looking, you know, uh, people in the hospital. Uh, just kidding. Uh, no. So, but, you know, the, the, the world, the hospital does not function without its administrative staff, no matter how much the doctors believe that it would, it would. So we've talked a little bit, of, and so I'm going to repeat myself in some cases, but we've talked that there are different kinds of physicians um, uh, out there. So the most common one, the one we think of, the one that the AMA kind of created uh, or endorsed is the medical doctor, the MD, right? That is an allopathic, that is an allopathic physician. So they have a, they're very much trained in the medical model. So they come out of that very traditional idea of when we were talking about the difference between, you know, uh, or, or our definition of health, and we said health isn't just the absence of disease, but the kind of presence of wellness. I would say kind of the MD tradition is much more on the absence of disease side of that definition. Now that, that said, there, aren't, there are plenty of MDs who have a broader sense of, of medicine and the role of medicine that is more holistic. Um, doctors of osteopathy or osteopathy, uh, DOs, um, second most common physician type. Uh, there used to be a fair difference. They have much more of, they come from a much more of a musculoskeletal kind of uh, emphasis. They tend to be much more holistic. Physical therapy kind of grows out of this chiropractor, chiropractors, um, kind of their tradition is an, is an osteopathic tradition. Um, Broadly, doctors of osteopathy are kind of trained a little more holistically to look at the pain. When I say holistic, I mean to, to think more in that wellness model rather than in the medical model of absence of disease. Um, podiatrists <clears throat> are also considered physicians. Um, and this changed, uh, I'm not sure the time frame, about 10 years. Um, so a, a podiatrist is basically um, from the knee down, right? So they, they, they take care of, uh, their, their primary focus is the foot and it's all its complexities and it's quite complicated, but that's a specialty and they are, and they are considered physicians. Um, uh, uh, so if you, if you meet a podiatrist in your travels, 
do not say, oh, you're not a physician, because they will get really angry at you. They go through a four-year um, program uh, of, of, of training as well. And then I mentioned before naturopathic doctors, NDs, um, much less common, not recognized in every state. And so when I talked about how the AMA was trying to squeeze out other types of physicians, this is one of the groups that they were fairly successful at, at limiting. Um, New Hampshire does license NDs. Uh, so you can see a naturopathic doctor and though they are very, um, so if you hear the phrase homeopathy, um, they embrace this kind of other tradition. We're not gonna say, I'm not gonna say a whole lot more about them because frankly, I don't know their tradition very well and they're not common. The big ones, the, the, big, the big two are the medical doctor, the MD and the DO. Um, the chief medical officer for core physicians, for example, uh, which is the physician group that supports Exeter Hospital is a DO. Um, the chief physician executive for, for um, uh, Exeter Hospital is a DO, right? So that the two senior doctors in the Exeter health system are DOs. So there's, there's nothing saying that, you know, uh, there, is, there is today, there's still some prejudice uh, uh, among MDs against DOs, but the medical training that DOs get is virtually identical to um, what MDs get going through their programs. Again, I think their tradition is a little more holistic, a little more wellness oriented rather than, than that kind of absence of disease orientation. <clears throat> so how do you become a physician? It's a long, road. Um, and, and it takes an incredible amount of sacrifice and discipline to get there. So um, uh, uh, I, I, I have never met a physician that I would regard as below average intelligence. Um, they to make it through that I, I don't like all of them, but I've never met one that I would say is below average intelligence. So they're all, you know, that process of, of becoming a physician is arduous, uh, requires a, a lot of discipline, self-discipline, sacrifice. And so, um, so to get there, you have to get a BA or a BS. You don't have to get a degree in a science. So I have met physicians who are English majors. I have met physicians who are history majors along with the traditional, like, uh, you know, chemistry major, engineer, whatever, um, you know, they, you have to, there is a set of, um, there is a set of courses that if you are interested at all in becoming a physician, you can go visit the pre-med um, uh, 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 program uh, director here. There is no, there is no pre-med major per se, um, uh, but you can visit the pre-med program and they will tell you it's, you know, these 10 courses you have to take. It's something like that, eight or 10 courses. You know, it's like biochemistry and, and uh, organic chemistry and uh, physics and a bunch of stuff. So you've got to do that, but, you, but the actual degree doesn't matter. And there are programs where if you're like, you know, after you graduate two years later, you're like, you know, I really regret not having tried for medical school. You can go back and there are these, all these programs that are like post, post back programs where they look at what you have and they're like, all right, you need these other six classes if you want to qualify to go to medical school. So it's not uncommon. My sister did that actually. Uh, my sister was a wildlife biology major. So she had a lot of the classes, but not quite all of them. So, you know, she went messed around in New York city for, a, you know, five or seven years and then realized uh, time to get serious. I think I want to go to medical school. And she had to do this kind of post back program. So you get your BA, you get those kind of baseline requirements and then you go to medical school. So you have to have, have a BA uh, in the United States. Uh, then you go to medical school. Medical school is four years. The first two years of medical school are pretty much all didactic, meaning classroom learning. You are redoing organic chemistry and all the other kind of uh, uh, nutrition, everything like that. It's very, very intense. Um, uh, uh, two years, but it is, but it is mostly classroom. And I'm saying there are, there are 
as many variations on what I'm telling you as there are medical schools. So just the generic kind of, the generic format is first two years are all didactic, meaning you're in a classroom and you're, and you're you know, learning from a fire hose. Um, the second two years, typically they begin their rotations and they go out into hospitals and clinics and start spending shadowing um, practicing physicians to learn about the different fields. So they rotate through, they spend six weeks in surgery, they spend six weeks in orthopedics, they spend six weeks in, in OB, they spend, you know, and so on, so that they get a little taste of all of, you know, most of the different specialties. The purpose of that in part is just for, for every physician to have some generic knowledge about all the fields of medicine but it is also to help them decide what they're, where they're going to go after they um, complete their uh, medical school. So technically when you graduate from medical school, you are a doctor and you can sit for your boards and, um, and, you, and, and people rightly would call you a physician. You are legally a physician. Um, you also have to complete a one year. If you don't do a residency and this is highly unusual these days, um, but if you don't do a residency, you still need to do a one-year internship, which is um, they typically, it's in a hospital, hospital-based internship where you, um, uh, it is all of the rest of the training, including the internship I'm talking about, are essentially apprenticeship style training where you are, um, uh, what is it, uh, what they say? Uh, see one, do one, teach one is kind of the model of, of medical training. So you get to watch a procedure, then you get to do the procedure, then you try to teach somebody else how to do the procedure. That's kind of the, kind of the stereotypical teaching style. So in order to practice in most states, you have to graduate from medical school and do at least a one-year internship. Um, that was the common model. Uh, my first boss in the army when I was, uh, I was working as a um, as a, uh, uh, administrator for, a for, a, a troop clinic, my first boss in the army did not go to do a residency. Now this was back in 92. Um, and he had been in the army for 20 years. So his training was back from the early, you know, from the sixties, he was actually a Vietnam vet. So he was, his training was from the sixties. So he was already kind of toward the end of his career. Um, he never did a residency. He had just done this one year internship and then just started practicing. So it was possible back in the day. I will tell you, even in 1992, he was a dinosaur in terms of how the, uh, the, um, how the um, industry had, had, had moved on, right? So most, you, you, it is difficult to practice today. So he would have been, we call a general practitioner. So he doesn't have, he didn't have any sort of specialty and he worked as a primary care physician. Um, so he provided that kind of low level, um, the low level is not the right way to think about it. That's kind of generic or general um, uh, care. Um, so all physicians or almost all physicians now will graduate from medical school and go to a residency. And that residency is where they learn their specialty. And even if you're going to be a primary care provider, you are going to go to a family medicine residency, a internal medicine residency, or a pediatrics residency. Those are the three um, primary care specialties, right? So my sister, for example, is a family medicine doctor. So she went to the, a family medicine um, uh, residency, which includes a one-year internship and then two years of kind of, uh, of, of, um, specialized, more specialized medicine. So a, uh, and we'll talk about some of these individuals. So I don't wanna to go too far into that. So they do a residency, right? And those residencies range anywhere from, and a lot of them include the internship. So they range anywhere from three years, which is, you know, family medicine and internal medicine to six years, depending on the, the specialty. Then after that, um, if you want to pursue a, a subspecialty um, or, a, or a medical specialty, and we'll talk about these in a second, you then do a fellowship. 
um, which, so if you wanna be say a hand surgeon, you would do a medical school, a five-year orthopedic surgery residency, and then you would go do a two-year um, hand fellowship, hand surgery fellowship. So it's a lot of training, right? They then get board certified. So they take, they have to pass their medical boards and then whichever specialties they go into, they have to take their boards for their specialties. So you'll see, you know, if you go into a physician's office, you'll see board certified in family medicine, board certified in orthopedics, board certified in whatever. Okay, so that's their training. So I wanna go a little further into, into physicians. So we can broadly break physician specialties into four kind of categories, medical, surgical, psychiatry, and hospital-based. So let me talk about each of these. So medical specialties include primary care, um, which, and within prim primary care, like I said, is um, family medicine and pediatrics, as well as internal medicine. Um, so if you're going to be a primary care physician, typically you're going to do one of those three. You're going to do family medicine, internal medicine, or pediatrics. Family medicine is <clears throat> what you think of as the traditional doctor, right? From the old school, um, you know, carrying the little bag. They're trained, so the family medicine residency is like a is like the medical school rotations just on steroids. They just do a lot more of them. And so they go around, family medicine doctors will go around and spend more time in surgery, more time in, um, you know, and then they learn things like dermatology and they learn things like endocrinology and they spend more time with all the specialists because they're trying to learn or they are, um, they are the classic mile wide and an inch deep, right? So they're trying to learn a little bit of everything about, um, about medicine because, a major, they, because their major functions are to manage your overall health. And so they need to be able to look at, you come in and you're like, well, I got this dry patch on my arm. They need to be able to look at that. They need to be like, well, I got a pain in my belly. They need to be able to kind of have a sense of what that might be, you know. Uh, it hurts my knee when I walk. So they're, got, you know, so they're doing a little bit of derm. They're doing a little GI. They're doing a little ortho, right? And so, you know, and each, you know, if you think about it, they'll see 30 patients a day and each patient's coming in and probably talking about a different, you know, system of the body. And so they need to know a little bit about everything. And they spend under our modern system, right? Our primary care providers are our gatekeepers to our specialists. So most of us um, are going to have health insurance that requires a referral. So primary care providers with their general knowledge are our first stop, right? In the medical, that, at least that's the, by design, they're our first stop in our medical journey you, to go to. And a lot of times they can resolve, you know, that first, that, that first layer problem. But when you say to them, hey, I've got this very specific thing, they can figure out and they can say, well, you know, um, you've got, I've got knee pain. All right, well, you know what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna send you to physical therapy first, let them work on seeing if they can give you some exercises. And if in six weeks it's still bothering you, then we'll send you to see the surgeon, right? Because we don't want, we don't want to use the big gun if the small gun will, will, will solve the problem, right? So family medicine, very broad. One of the internal medicine and family medicine are very similar. Internal medicine and family medicine are covering all the systems. Um, the difference between family medicine and internal medicine, a couple of things. One, family medicine does the full range of, of ages. So family medicine is from, from birth to death, right? Including OB. So, so if your family medicine, you're, 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 in order to get to graduate from a family medicine residency, you have to do a certain number of deliveries, right? Um, internal medicine doctors do not do that. So that is not part of, I mean, they may do it, but it's not part of their, it's not part of their residency requirements. 
Family medicine doctors have to spend a significant amount of time in, in pediatrics. Internal, medicines, internal medicine doctors are adult medicine doctors. They don't do, they get some exposure, but it's not part of their, it's not a specific part of their training. <clears throat> so, and then family medicine will spend more time generally on, on lower level surgical, learning some lower level surgical stuff. Um, peds, obviously we all had a pediatrician once upon a time. Well, maybe uh, most of you probably had a pediatrician at once upon a time. They, you know, specialize in kids. Um, I have a, I have a friend from the, uh, from the, uh, from my service who is currently the, um, division surgeon for the 101st airborne. So it's a pretty cool, uh, thing. She is a pediatrician by training. Um, and then she did a adolescent medicine fellowship. And, um, and I was like, okay, why, you know, uh, what does that mean? And she said, well, I cover uh, kids, I forget, I believe it's like 13 to 25, which would cover most of you in this room, I think. Technically, you're still kind of in this adolescent phase. And what she was saying was, you know, there are a lot of systems that don't stop developing until you hit about 25. So your brain, for example, is still forming um, as you sit here, uh, most of you, um, right? And it doesn't stop maturing until you hit about 25, which is, you know, some of the, so some of the issues of like, you know, marijuana smoking has, has been shown to have more impact on, on people of adolescent age. And that's when most people start smoking it um, than it does on, mature adults, right? Because your brain is still forming. Um, so, so what's for her being adolescent medicine, well, the vast majority of the, of the army is, is 18 to 25. Uh, so it's a kind of a perfect uh, specialty actually for, for being, a, uh, being what is effectively the team doctor for a, uh, an infantry division. Um, so pediatrics covers basically, you know, most people transition out of pediatrics at about 16, um, but you could still conceivably be seen by say, a, you know, uh, an adolescent medicine, medicine doctor into your early twenties, uh, though most people don't. Um, so uh, then we have um, uh, other medical specialties include neurology and dermatology. And the reason I have them listed here is they are different Neurology, so neurology is a study of the nervous system um, and the brain. And dermatology is, of course, the study of the skin um, and the dermis, right? The largest organ, organ in the body, the skin, right, is, is the largest organ in the body. It's actually an org, it's considered an organ system. Um, the reason I have them listed here separately is because these are, so the, these are the, um, specialties that you can go into without then having to do a fellowship. Now, if you want to become a cardiologist, for example, that is an internal medicine subspecialty. So in order to become a cardiologist, you have to do an internal medicine um, residency, and then you do a cardiology fellowship. Okay, so, but it is possible and common that someone would do an internal medicine um, residency and then just stop because they want to be a primary care provider. So they, someone goes through their internal medicine residency and they say, you know what, I wanna be a primary care doctor. I wanna you know, take care of adult patients um, on, at that kind of primary care level um, that they can just stop there. But if you want to go on and so the, the, the specialties, neurology and dermatology, don't require a internal medicine residency. But if you want to do any of these specialties, you have to first do a internal medicine residency and then a fellowship. So cardiology, study of the heart, endocrinology, the endocrine system. So this is your, um, uh, your immune system. So... Um, uh, so if you have, so a common illness in, uh, in women is, um, 
uh, hypothyroidism. So the thyroid gland in your neck um, is a uh, is one of the probably some of you know this better than I do, but is a governing uh, gland that it 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 it, it, if it kind of directs an awful lot um, uh, of the other subsystems of the body. Um, and a lot of women, the, the thyroid stops functioning. And so uh, you get what's called hypothyroidism, which is underactive thyroid. That can lead to uh, uh, feeling tired all the time, weight gain, um, and, it, it, and, and then it leads to, in the, if it's untreated, it leads to a lot of other um, bad uh, long-term health effects. So that's just one example of, and that's a simple one that, you know, once it's, once it is diagnosed, it can be taken care of by, uh, typically by a family medicine doctor. GI gastroenterology, I've joked about this. This is, uh, you know, you win the, you win your first trip to the GI when you turn 50 to get your colonoscopy. So the GI is the entire gastro gastroenterological system. So it is, um, digestive system. It is, you know, the liver, the, um, uh, uh, pancreas, all the systems that kind of work to, and then the bowel. Uh, so it's how we get our nutrition and so forth. Um, hematology is a study of blood, um, infectious disease, big deal right now. Right. So it is the study of infectious disease, obviously, um, you know, in normal, in, in, in extreme times, it's, you know, worrying about COVID, but in less, you know, un, unusual times, it is um, infectious disease doctors get called in when someone has a wound that won't heal and they can't figure out what it is that's wrong with them. Someone comes in with uh, uh, a disease that they're having difficulty um, identifying. That is, uh, they get called in a lot for this. They're also kind of closely related to the public health field. Uh, nephrology is the study of the kidneys. Oncology is your cancer doctors. Uh, pulmonary is the um, uh, uh, your airways, right? So your lungs, they specialize in, in, in taking care of uh, uh, your breathing and there's more, right? So, so in order to get to one of these specialties, you have to do the internal medicine. So you do your you do your medical school, then your internal medicine residency, and then um, a fellowship in one of these. And then these have further fellowships, right? So then you can, uh, my brother-in-law is a um, electrophysiologist. So this is a cardiologist who is then subspecialized in um, doing things like pacemakers, valve replacements, and things like that. So he does a bunch of, of that kind of, uh, of work. So he then, so he had to go to four years of medical school, three years of internal medicine, uh, three years of cardiology, then two years of, of EP training. So it's a, it's a long, long road, right? So, so that's kind of the medical specialties. Then the surgical specialties, and this kind of like our, this goes back to our discussion. Back in the day, back in you know, good old Europe, um, the medical specialties were the were the physicians that had gone to, um, you know, medical school in Europe. Um, the surgeons were your tradesmen; they were the barbers, and right, so they were looked down on. Uh, today, that's obviously not the case. Um, but the surgical specialties include general surgery, orthopedic surgery, and they have, and then orthopedic surgery has a whole bunch of subspecialties: spine, hand, hip, and so forth. Uh, urology is um, uh, study of uh, 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 the urinary system. It also gets into uh, uh, um, uh, uh, if, if you can't, um, I'm, I'm blanking on the words here, but sorry, uh, you know, incontinence. So if you can't, you know, this is a thing that hits for guys, our prostate, you know, is the gland that controls uh, when we pee and when we don't pee. And so you get old, uh, your prostate gets inflamed and you can't control, you know, you have to go pee all the time. Um, so that's, you know, urology will pay attention to that. 
uh, that, you know, if that doesn't goes untreated, that's cancer in the prostate is common amongst men. Um, so they, so they deal with, so urologists will often deal with cancer. Women often have incontinence issues after, after having children. Um, you know, so there, so there is that kind of, uh, study plastic surgery. We often think of as, um, uh, uh, as cosmetic surgery, but, but cosmetic is actually just a sub subset of what plastics do. Um, so plastic is, is, is surgery primarily focused on, you know, skin. Um, but, uh, uh, plastic surgeons are trained to deal with burn patients, for example. So if you were in, if you were in an accident and got badly burned, a plastic surgeon would take care of you to work on skin grafts and things like that. They do a lot of reconstruction. So if you were say in a bad accident and, you know, harmed your face, they would come in and, and, and do that kind of work as well. And then of course they do boobs and butts and, you know, and tummies and all the other stuff too, right? As, uh, um, and that's, that's a piece of what they do, but it's, but, but you don't want to, to mistake the fact that yes, that's kind of what they get known for, but they really primarily, you know, the discipline is, is, is really heavily focused on reconstruction, right? Um, OBGYN, so uh, special, specialize in obstetrics, that's, you know, pregnancy, dealing with all the around pregnancy and managing childbirth, gynecology, uh, you know, dealing with, with women's uh, systems. Ophthalmology uh, is eyes, right? So this is a, is distinct from optometry, which we'll talk about in a little bit, these are the folks who actually, so ophthalmologists are the ones who actually do surgery on your eyes, whereas optometrists typically don't do any in intervention like that, right? Um, so an ophthalmologist is an eye surgeon. So if you get cataracts, right, and they need to go in and take those out, that's, that's uh, um, what an ophthalmologist does. They don't do glasses for you, right? That's not what they do. Um, and then neurosurgery. So this is the surgical side of neurology, right? So they'll work hand in hand with the neurologist um, and, you know, they're literally, they're brain surgeons, right? So um, uh, spinal cord issues, things like that. So that's, so those are your surgical specialties. And then many of these also have uh, subspecialties. So for example, they deal with cancer. Um, they may sub, you, uh, you know, a urologist may subspecialize in, in urological oncology, for example, right? So they'll specialize in prostate cancer, okay? So this whole kind of, we're gonna be doing a, a bit of a catalog, you know, today, but, but it's really important to kind of understand who's, who's out there doing this stuff. So, Psychiatry, oops, there we go. All right. Psychiatry kind of sits by itself. Um, so there's a difference between psychiatry and psychology and counseling. They come from the same tradition, but psychiatry, to become a psychiatrist, you have to go to medical school first, do, and, then, and then you do a psychiatry residency. And what psychiatrists can do, so probably many of you have gone to counseling for various, um, you know, you may have seen a psychologist, you may have seen a LSW, um, LCSW, licensed clinical social worker uh, for counseling, for therapy. Psychiatrists can do that. They typically get, they are typically trained to do talk therapy. That's what you typically do with a, say, LCSW, right? Um, but what a psychiatrist can do that a licensed clinical social worker cannot do, what a clinical psychologist cannot do is they can prescribe uh, psychoactive drugs. So they can prescribe um, you know, drugs if you have chronic depression, if you have anxiety, if you have schizophrenia, if you have any bipolar, they are able to evaluate and then treat you medically for your psychiatric issues. And they, generally speaking, they work hand in hand with a um, psychologist or therapist, right? Because treating, 
treating um, psychiatric issues just with drugs is to kind of miss half of the game, half of the problem. Now that said, um, you can, uh, your, your family practice doctor can administer and prescribe uh, uh, low level uh, medications for, for lower level psychiatric issues. So if you're coming in with some sort of short-term generalized anxiety, for example, they can prescribe for you. But typically, if it seems like you have a chronic long-term issue, your family medicine doctor is going to refer you to a psychiatrist to get more kind of robust uh, diagnosis and treatment. But it is really important that psychiatry work with um, therapy. The two, are, the two together are much more effective than drugs alone. Um, and, and often drugs can uh, uh, supplement, complement, um, uh, can complement talk therapy to, to better effect. And a lot of psychiatric drugs are temporary, right? You, you, um, most, most people will experience a period of severe depression in their life, at least one, right? Um, and that can be brought on by a whole range of trauma, you know, um, uh, from, and trauma I'm using and not necessarily physical trauma, I'm using divorce, you know, um, life stages, turning 40, things like that can cause, can cause, you know, can cause depression, depends on where you are in your life, right? Whole range of things can cause that depression to trigger. Um, and it is, it is normal to experience that, right? Um, and so, so that's where I say like a family medicine doctor can, would, you know, recognize that. But if the issue becomes chronic, becomes extended, then you want to be under the care of a psychiatrist. If the issue is more uh, uh, more serious, bipolar, uh, um, or or um, other personality disorders, or um, schizophrenia, for example, that's not appropriate to be managed by a family medicine doctor. It'd be a psychiatrist. So, uh, an interesting field. Um, and you know, once upon a time, psychiatry was was just talk therapy because we didn't have drugs that worked. So it was you know, physician who then learned kind of talk therapy, and um, you know, so some psychiatrists still do talk therapy, uh, but most do not. And the reason most do not is because the medical field is specialized, right? And since psychiatrists are the only ones that can manage long-term psychiatric conditions medically, they tend to specialize in pharmaceutical management of psychiatric conditions. Whereas, um, and then they allow, and then they, they, they'll do some limited talk therapy with the patient, but, but um, cost wise, you know, we're going to talk a lot more about cost. Uh, uh, but one way to keep the cost down is instead of using a psychiatrist to do talk therapy, you use who, you know, has four years of medical school. Uh, I can't remember three or four years. Uh, I think, yeah, three or four years. I, I can't remember off the top of my head. It's, it's four. All right. For psychiatry is four. I know I've got it listed later. Um, uh, you know, so now you're talking eight years of training eight years of post-baccalaureate training, so, so eight years of graduate training, as opposed to a licensed um, uh, clinical social worker who's a master's degree, right? So two years. So it's a lot less expensive to use an LCSW to do the talk therapy and then, and then tie them together with a psychiatrist who can just you know, see you in 20 minutes, reevaluate your medical needs, your medication needs, and then kick you out the door and get the next person in. So they tend to, so the psychiatry practices tend to be, you know, primarily around medical management. All right, the last group um, is, is kind of broadly what we refer to as hospital-based um, physician specialties. So emergency medicine. Emergency medicine is a relatively recent um, uh, uh, field. Um, they are emergency medicine physicians are trained to operate uh, in and around a 
uh, in, in, in an emergency department. Um, so they work in the ED uh, and they are trained to you know, handle the full range of, of urgent and, uh, and life endangering care. And you know, uh, if you talk to an ED doc, um, they, you know, they tend to be a little bit on the adrenaline junkie side. They like the woo, you know, crazy stuff happening and something's gotta be done right away. Um, uh, but you know, they'll, I remember talking with, uh, you guys ever watch like um, ER, the TV show ER or Chicago Hope or those, or like, I don't know, Grey's Anatomy is probably more in like your time, right? So I, I joke with I, I joke with uh, uh, with an ED doc that I used to work with because we were talking about funding for training for him. I'm like, well, I just I'm just going to get you like a season, you know, a CD uh, or DVDs of uh, of ER, and then you don't have to go to training. You just watch that. So he was we were laughing, but he's like, yeah, you know, what happens in one show in in ER or Grey's Anatomy is like is like a, a whole career like the craziness that happens, you know, in one show and e e ER is like, is like what happens to somebody in a, you know, many years. Um, but they're, they're trained to deal with these weird, you know, rapid diagnosis, rapid evaluation, rapid treatment, but they are not, but the ED, you know, the ED is a pass-through point. Like we're going to evaluate you if you're, you know, um, stabilize you and then push you on to either higher care or, or, or discharge you. Right. So one of the primary ways that people come to be in a hospital, primary ways that people are admitted into the hospital is through the ED. I come in with chest pain. They evaluate me. Yep. You're having a heart attack. Off you go to the medicine ward. Right. You are, you know, you have some other condition. Oh, now it looks like you're going to need surgery. We're going to have a, have a surgeon come down, look at you. Nope. Off you go to the you know, OR and then over to the surgical ward. So the ED is a pass through point. Um, and a gateway very often to the hospital and its services, um, but not the preferred one, right? Um, radiology, these are the folks that specialize in imaging of all sorts. And we talked about, you know, last time we, I showed you the, the first, the first x-ray, right? Imagine not having x-rays, not being able to look inside the body without cutting it open to see what's going on. Um, and we have, you know, so radiology allows us, so imaging, right, now includes, you know, of course, x-rays, but MRI, mag magnetic resonance imaging. So they're using, you know, MRI is a great big magnet. That's why you have to take off, you know, all your, all your metal if you go into a, to, a, uh, to the um, MRI, because it'll, it'll suck all your, you know, pull all your metal to it, um, rip your earrings out, things like that. Uh, you know, ultrasound where we're using sound waves. So, so if you've ever seen, a, you know, one of your friends or family members gets a pregnancy ultrasound and I look at those and I'm like, ah, it's just a blob, but whatever, you know, I'm like, oh, there's the hands and I'm like, it's a blob. I don't see anything, but you know, they train, you know, actually they're much better now than, than they were back in the day. Uh, but they are trained to, to, to look at all that. Um, so they do all that, but then they also, we also have interventional radiology. So if you have the misfortune to get cancer, um, they will treat you with radiation. The radiologist is a person that, you know, focuses the radiation um, to hopefully kill the, you know, kill the uh, cancerous cells. Uh, so they have a range of, of things that they do. Um, pathology, so, but again, hospital-based, right? So the emergency physician, works in an emergency department. They're not like setting up a shingle out, out on the street. Um, they, are, they are meant to manipulate the, the, the technology and the systems of the hospital. So that's why they're hospital-based. Radiology, same thing, right? We've got these huge expensive um, uh, uh, systems that the radiologist has to use. A radiologist without their, without their tools is just, you know, not not particularly useful. Let me put it that way. Right. Perfectly nice people, but not particularly useful. Um, pathology. Uh, so pathology. So this was my dad's specialty uh, before he retired. So pathology is laboratory medicine, very much laboratory medicine. Um, so they specialize in diagnosis. 
right, using laboratory tools. So if you, um, so the pathologist typically, every hospital has to have a pathologist on staff. And what they do is they oversee the laboratory. So all the, every time you pee in a cup or, uh, or get a blood sample, the pathologist is overseeing that process. They are not necessarily actually doing the, the review. We have medical technologists and medical technicians who then you know, do the, the oversight of the actual testing. But if you come in with something really weird, right? Um, or you get, or you are getting a biopsy because you've got a lump in your breast and they do a punch biopsy and they take some, a tissue sample. That tissue sample goes down to the laboratory and gets seen by the pathologist who then makes slides and looks under a microscope and says, okay, that, that tissue is cancerous, um, it's malignant, right? They make that call. They're the ones that say, you know, you get the big C, right? That's, 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 that's what they do. They also, and very often, you know, so my dad would be on call on the weekends if someone was getting emergency surgery, right? Uh, they would call him to come in because they would take out, you know, they would take out uh, uh, some tissue and they'd want him to evaluate it. So the surgeon would be looking at, you know, at something that might be cancerous. And so they'd want my, the pathologist to, to evaluate it and say, yes or no, this is cancerous tissue. They also do, though less often now, autopsies, right? Which is someone dies um, and they want to figure out what was the cause of death. That's what a pathologist does. So medical examiner is a pathologist right, who specializes in, well, it's a pathologist. We get some criminal you know, medical examiners that do all that kind of stuff. But, you know, he, you know, my dad used to do um, uh, autopsies all the time as part of his, uh, part of his work. But again, very much anchored in the hospital, right? He's overseeing the laboratory diagnostic systems, right? Using the tools. So these are doctors who are very much, you know, technology oriented, anchored in the hospital. And then anesthesiology. Thank God for anesthesiology, right? Um, you know, you definitely don't want a colonoscopy without anesthesiology uh, or surgery of any sort, really, right? So anesthesiology specialty uh, obviously is, is, you know, passing gas. That's our little gag in the medical field, right? So they're always passing gas. Um, but that's not all they do. Um, more recently, um, they have gotten into the field of pain management. So I have a distant relative um, from the same island as my dad uh, uh, in, in Italy, um, uh, also uh, Dr. Bonica. So it's kind of funny because my dad would occasionally get mixed up with this other guy, Dr. Bonica. John Bonica um, who, uh, so was a um, physician to pay for, for, to pay for uh, uh, med uh, college and medical school. He became a professional wrestler. <laughs> um, and uh, so he was John the Bull Bonica. And, um, and, uh, and, and uh, ironically, one time my sister and I were in an Applebee's someplace, um, some random place, and they had a poster on the wall of John the Bull Bonica, one of these kind of old timey kind of things. And it was so hilarious. But John the Bull Bonica, uh, through this kind of, you know, old school professional wrestling, you know, uh, did a lot of harm to himself, you know, physically. And so he had a lot of back pain and other pains. And so he became an anesthesiologist ultimately. And then he, and then he basically pioneered the study of pain. Um, and uh, so if you ever meet an anesthesiologist, if you're ever in an anesthesiologist's office, there's a high probability if you look behind them on their bookshelf will be Bonica's pain management is one of the most common. Um, but I've had students, you know, in the, I had an I had a, CRNA, which we'll talk about in a minute, uh, certified, uh, certified uh, nurse anesthetist. I'm blanking on um, a nurse anesthetist. And he's like, wait a minute, I know that name. Um, so, so pain management has become a, a field that anesthesiologists also do. So they don't just do, um, you know, they don't, they are not just involved in um, managing the anesthesia during a 
uh, surgical procedure, they are also consulting with people with, with chronic pain issues. So that's a whole other kind of subfield. So all these fields have often have buried in them many subfields that physicians can get involved with. Uh, so, so I just want to, so I think this is kind of interesting. Um, so we can look at the income. So this is a median income. So the middle, uh, middle income. So you can see a, a pretty wide range of income by specialty. And it is loosely tied to the number of years of training that are required. But you can see like your, your family medicine doc makes about 250, you know, pediatrics, they're kind of um, the lowest paid if you're a general pediatrics. Now, if you're a pediatrician, you can then subspecialize, you know, be a pedi pediatric endocrinologist or a pediatric dermatologist, things like that. Then you make more money. But if you're a kind of a general pediatrician, um, they tend to be the lowest paid um, uh, physicians. Uh, general internal medicine, again, you right, um, hospitalists. So your book talks a bit about hospitalists. This is a relatively recent evolution. So if you were a family medicine doctor back in the day, um, if one of your patients got sick, right, um, and got admitted to the hospital, uh, if they were admitted through the ED, they would call you as the family medicine doc and say, hey, you know, uh, uh, Mrs. Mrs. Jones, your patient has been admitted uh, for, you know, a heart attack or uh, pneumonia or whatever. Uh, You'll want to, we want you, to, you'll need to come by and uh, uh, check her status and, <clears throat> and update her orders. And so you as family medicine doctor would go truck over at, you know, typically at the beginning of the day before you started your clinic at your office, or at the end of the day, you would go back to the hospital and you would round on all your patients. You would visit all your patients who are, who, who were, you know, who got, normally got their care from you in an outpatient setting, you would then go in and check on all your patients. Um, and, and you would tell the nurses, this is what I want you to do for Mrs. Jones. And then you'd, you know, next day you'd come back um, and you'd check her again. And you're like, all right, it's ready. Mrs. Jones is ready to be discharged nurse. Here's my instructions on, uh, on discharge and off you go. Well, that's a long day, right? That's a long day. So you're you know, coming in at five, six o'clock in the morning, rounding on all your patients, then off to, the, off to the office to see patients all day. Then before you go home at night, you're getting you know, another, you know, not rounding again. Um, you know, and then if anything, you know, if, if Mrs. Jones goes sour in the middle of the night, you're getting a call, hey, Mrs. Jones, you know, we need you to come look at Mrs. Jones. That's a tough life. Some physicians loved it. A lot of physicians hated it. Um, and so what has emerged is this new, um, this new field called the hospitalist or this new kind of, uh, yeah, this new uh, service, I guess you'd say. Now hospitalist, it, there isn't a, it isn't a, um, a specialty per se, like you don't go to a hospitalist residency. Pretty much any physician can do it. It's typically done by family medicine docs and internal medicine docs. Um, but again, like, you know, every medical subspecialist is, oh, by the way, also an internal medicine doc, so they could do it, right? So like my uh, brother-in-law, like I mentioned, who's that, that highly specialized uh, uh, cardiology guy, occasionally pulls, pulls shifts as, a, as an internal, as a, as a hospitalist. Um, so hospitalists, these are the, so, so instead of you coming in as, you know, in the morning and in the evening to check on your patients, your patient gets admitted and you're like, all right, Mrs. Jones, take care. I'll see you around. You know, not quite like that, it's not, <laughs> but you don't, you don't get called continuously to go check on. You're not managing her care. Instead, a physician who is hospital based is, is managing the care of your patient. And a lot of times they will coordinate with the primary care provider, you know, uh, but, but once you're admitted, you are typically admitted into the care of the hospitalists. Um, and these are for internal medicine, primarily for internal medicine patients, but they, oh, uh, uh, but they do oversee, um, they kind of broadly oversee all of the patients who are, are currently inpatient. Um, then you have ICUs, 
right? So intensive care units, they will, hospitalists will provide that care there. Typically we'll also have a pulmonologist uh, uh, as the kind of um, medical director for an ICU um, because very often I, you're in the ICU because you are having trouble breathing. So if you're going to be intubated, typically you'll be intubated in the ICU. And that's where uh, critical care physicians or who are, are basically pulmonologists uh, uh, reside. So that's a, another variation. And it's a good quality of life. Uh, a lot of physicians like this because it's a little bit like being an ED doc. You pull a 12 hour shift, at the end of the day, you hand off your patients to your, your colleague and you go home and you don't get any call, right? Until you come back the next day for another 12 hour shift. And you might do, you know, three 12 hour shifts a week and then you have the rest of the time off. Like it's a nice, it's a nice quality of life. Um, ED docs are also a good quality of life because again, there's no continuity there, right? You don't own the patient unless you are on call, uh, on, on the ward, right? When you go, when you punch out at the end of your shift, you hand off the patient to whoever's coming on and, you know, and when they get discharged, you may never see them again. Whereas with the primary care, the, the reason people go into primary care is because they want that longitudinal relationship. People who are drawn to pediatrics, who are drawn to internal medicine, family medicine, want to have that year in, year out relationship with you um, and manage your care over a long period of time, get to know you, get to know about your kids, you know, all that, and, and kind of interact with you over a long period of time. Hospitalists, they don't do that. ED docs don't do that, right? All the rest of the specialists are basically like, you know, I got this skin thing. All right, great. I'm going to treat the skin thing. You know, see ya. And you may never go see the dermatologist again, right? Or maybe you will, but you'll only talk about the skin thing. You won't talk about uh, your knee pain or whatever, right? And so, so most of these specialists are, are kind of transactional in the sense they come in problem-centered, right? They, they treat the problem and then off you go. So, uh, so you can see, I just throw these numbers up here to kind of make your eyeballs pop out of your head a little bit. Um, but, uh, you know, if you're at all thinking about medical school, <laughs> it's a good gig. Uh, it's very expensive, right? Because you're going to have four years of, you know, you're already in your four, first four years. Then you got four years of medical school, you know, uh, and then, you know, residency and fellowship and all that. Now, a particularly good gig is if you join the military, because then the military will pay for your medical school. They'll put you on active duty and you'll do your residency in a military hospital where you are paid the whole time uh, a decent wage and then you owe the military back some amount of time payback, but you know, maybe five years, six years, and then you have no debt and you're done. So a lot of physicians will take what's called an HPSP scholarship to medical school, uh, health professions, something, whatever it is. Um, but they'll, you'll get a, you know, so you can get a medical a scholarship to medical school. They pay you. Uh, while you're in medical school, you draw second lieutenant pay, which is pretty decent. It's like $50,000 a year. So instead of taking out loans, you're getting paid um, to go to medical school. Uh, and then you graduate, you go on active duty, and they plop you into a residency that, you know, now you get paid captain's wages, which is a little better. Not great, but, but a little better. And then you owe the army back, you know, five, six years, whatever it is. Yes, ma'am. Medical school, I think it really ranges, but I'm, I'm thinking 60, 70,000, something like that. But I, I'm just really kind of pulling that out of the air. It's expensive. Um, sorry? Upper 60, upper, I mean, it really, right. And then life, you know, life costs and all that too, right? So you're, you know, if you're going to medical school, you're probably not doing a whole lot of part-time work. Though my dad worked as an EMT when, when he was in medical school, so. Um, yeah. Uh, so interesting stuff, good money. But I mean, just look at that. When I, that's medical training, that's in addition, that's after your BA. So you've got, first you got your four years of BA, then you're doing, you know, 10, 11 more years of training. So you're like in your thirties, you know, well into your thirties by the time you're, if you're going to be a, you know, what was a electrocardio, electrophysiology, like my, my brother-in-law, like he was, you know, 35 by the time he finished his training. So 
it's a it's a long road to go with you know making very little money but then you know you can do this work till you're into your late 60s 70s unless something goes wrong you know you can work a long time most doctors work until they're you know late 60s um okay so so it's a good field you know huge amount of respect well earned um but the thing about um you know the, the thing about we talked a little about your you know we talked a little bit about physician training and your book made a fuss about you know going to um you know, going to college and getting trained in a formal medical school and how historically in the United States, you know, it was very much a apprenticeship process. I will tell you, if you talk to any physician, they will tell you physician training is apprenticeship style training. Like that's what it is. So, so residency, you go and you, you're a, you know, you graduate from medical school and you start your residency. You, the, the, it's fun to talk to, if you get a chance to talk to a doctor, say, when did you know you were really a doctor? Like, was it when you like walked across the stage after, after medical school or was it sometime, like, when did you really internalize that? And, and the, the answer is typically like, oh no, it was several years into, you know, it was a couple of years into residency. I was, you know, terrified to tell anybody I was a doctor until, you know, well, terrified, my, but, you know, but um, most physicians are not comfortable with their physician identity until they're a couple of years into their, you know, well into residency. And then they, you know, they'll tell you, it takes 10 years to master, to feel like you've mastered your craft. So like, you know, I'll talk, talk to, I've, I teach a, I teach into a physician leadership program that we have here at UNH. So I get a chance to interact with a lot of these folks in addition to my professional career, but I specifically ask these questions to the folks in the leadership roles. And they're typically like, yeah, you know, I graduate from residency and I start here at my clinic and I'll be talking to a patient and, uh, and they'll have something and I'll be like, oh my God, I don't, know what, I, don't, I don't know the answer to this. I'm like, I'll be right back. And then you run outside and they grab a textbook and they're flipping through the textbook to get the answers. You know, I say, you know, it takes, it takes a number of years post, post residency even to get really comfortable. So anyway, um, so it's a huge amount of work to become a physician, um, but it is very much an apprenticeship model. Um, and there's, uh, we'll probably talk about this, but there's a lot of kind of, um, let's say dysfunction in, in medical training too. There's a lot of kind of abusive, you know, frat boy kind of, of behavior. That's not quite the right word. There's a lot of, it's not like sexual. It, 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 it's more like disrespectful, right? Um, uh, uh, behavior. And so there's a lot of that happens. So when physicians want to become physician leaders, they often, and, and part of it is really comes back to um, the physicians, the physician is individually responsible for the well being of the patient. So if anything goes wrong while the patient is under their care, they are individually responsible for that. And they can be financially liable for it, right? So um, if you know get sued, almost every physician I know has been sued at some point for something. I mean, my dad, who worked in the laboratory and didn't really like didn't touch living patients, um, was sued at one point. You know, so my sister has been sued. Um, every almost everybody, and, and it has. It doesn't matter if you're a good doctor or bad doctor. Sooner or later, you'll you know not necessarily make a mistake, but there'll be a gray, something gray about your choices and somebody will go for the money and try to sue you. Um, so they are aware of that and they live under that threat every day. So <clears throat> they're trained to be like, you are the, the buck stops with you, right? And so if you screw this up, it's your fault and you're gonna, you know, you could lose, you know, not only could you get sued, but you could lose your license as a result. And so that, you know, 11 years of training just down the drain. So, um, so it's interesting to work with them when talking about leadership because they tend to be very like, you will do this now. Um, we're not going to discuss it. <laughs> not you, the patient, but you like a nurse or you, you know, administrator. No, you will do this because I told you because my authority, right? which is not a great way to be a leader. Um, so let's talk about mid-levels. Um, 
uh, I call them mid-levels, um, non-physician providers. So, and I'm focusing here on physician assistants and nurse practitioners. Um, uh, uh, so they can, so they are, um, used to be uh, PAs were a four-year uh, degree. Then they've become, uh, actually, I think they started out as an associate level degree. They actually started in the military. Um, uh, so back when I was a young lieutenant, they were, um, they were warrant officers. I don't know if you know that, Andy. Um, so they were warrant officers. They weren't even officers. And then they became commissioned officers, which means nothing to most of you, I think. Um, but uh, but that they grew out of the military. Um, they kind of grew out of the military uh, environment. And the idea is they are also referred to as, and they don't like this, but they are referred to as physician extenders. So the idea of a PA was, you know, the, the name is physician assistant. So the idea was we give somebody who's not a physician a bunch of kind of technical training so that they can kind of extend the ability of, you know, be a, be a multiplier for the physician. So the physician can, you know, they, can, they are often used um, to assist physicians in surgery, for example. So you can have surgical PAs. They are often used as primary care providers. Um, so when I was in a combat unit, my primary care provider, my primary care provider was my PA. Um, uh, and so he took care of kind of the day-to-day -day primary care of all of the men in the unit. It was an all male unit. So it was all the men in the unit. Um, uh, but they are, you know, today PAs are, are typically master's degree uh, trained. Um, and so it's a two year uh, program. Nurse practitioners, also a relatively, re relatively recent innovation. Um, so a nurse practitioner, you need to have an RN first. So typically it's a, it is also a master's degree. Um, you can earn, um, uh, you, you typically do your four year RN and then you go on uh, to do your nurse practitioner training. Um, Nurse practitioners are probably most commonly employed as family nurse practitioners, so FNPs, um, uh, though you see a lot of them now going into the psychiatric field. PAs and nurses can prescribe medication. So a psychiatric nurse practitioner uh, uh, would be able to prescribe within limits certain psychiatric medications. So that's where they're useful. Um, so they can, so less expensive to train than a psychiatrist, so less expensive to have on staff. Um, uh, and so you could have, you know, uh, a supervising psychiatrist, say at an inpatient mental facility, a behavioral health facility, and then you would probably have multiple um, uh, psychiatric nurse practitioners that, you know, provided some of the care extending uh, extending the effect of the psychi psychiatrist. And so the psychiatrist would provide treatment primarily to the only the most sick individuals, right? And would then just generally provide oversight of the nurse practitioner's practices. One of the things that um, historically was true is physician assistants and nurse practitioners could not practice independently. So you couldn't, if you were a PA or a nurse practitioner, you couldn't just graduate, get licensed, and then hang out a shingle and start seeing patients, even though you're perfectly capable of doing so, right? You had to do so under the supervision of a physician, meaning the physician had to review your records periodically and, and, and verify that you are practicing appropriately. Um, Various states, and it varies state by state, whether, whether PAs and nurse practitioners can uh, practice independently. I believe New Hampshire, I should know this, but uh, I believe New Hampshire nurse practitioners can practice independent of a physician, but it varies state by state. So wherever you are, you're gonna need to, you know, you'll need to check that. Um, and PAs, so one of the things, uh, 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 that is happening today is PAs are also subspecializing. And so there we have, you have surgical PAs, you have emergency department PAs, you have 
you know, on and on and on. So they're going and getting advanced training um, uh, and able to uh, provide higher levels of care. So many of our PAs and nurse practitioners today are probably far more skilled than our physicians of 30 or 40 years ago. You know, um, the good thing about PAs and nurse practitioners is again, they act as kind of what we'd say in the military as force multipliers, right? So you have your very expensive physician asset and then you can have nurse practitioners and PAs working with them often in the same clinic and they may, you know, um, what's useful about, you know, particularly say for providing primary care, um, most people don't need to see a physician for their primary care. Most of you probably are, are healthy. And even if you have a chronic condition like diabetes, for example, a nurse practitioner is perfectly capable of managing that once it's under control. Um, and in fact, there have been studies showing that um, the health outcomes of people who, are, who have their primary care managed by nurse practitioners are as satisfied and their outcomes are as good as if they were managed by a family medicine doc or an internal medicine doc. So the quality of care is, is, is equal um, under most circumstances. So if you were running a clinic and you're trying to provide services for a large population, what makes sense is, so, so let's say primary care, if you're trying to run a, a primary care clinic for a large population, what would make sense is you have a handful of physicians, internal medicine, pediatrics, you know, family medicine, and then you have a whole bunch of nurse practitioners and PAs because they get paid a third, you know, of what physicians get paid and you can, and they provide the same level of care for the average patient. And so what you can do is all the otherwise healthy patients can be followed by nurse practitioners and PAs with an occasional like, hey doc, I don't, this weird thing, you know, I've got this patient who's got this weird thing. Can you come take a look at them? Oh, sure, come look at that one time, you know, one off consult and then off, then they're back. And the doctors can focus on the people who have multiple comorbidities, right? People who have, you know, diabetes and COPD and, heart, you know, and on and on, right? People who have, um, who have multiple complex medical problems. So I am luckily still relatively healthy and I'm providing, and my primary care provider is a nurse practitioner. She's great. I like her. Um, and, and, but, uh, I had this like bump on my back that, you know, just wasn't going away. And so I said, Hey, you know what? Uh, she looked at it and she's like, I think it's benign. It's been there for, you know, years. And I'm like, yeah, I kind of want to just get it out. So we made an appointment with the, with the physician who worked at the clinic and he, you know, did a punch biopsy, took it out, sent it off to the lab just to make sure. Yep. Benign. Um, but he was able to do that. She's not able to do minor surgery. He was able to do minor surgery right in the clinic, right? So, so you, what, in order to save money, right? This is an evolution that's happening uh, uh, is it is cost effective. And so that's why we're seeing this pro proliferation of, of nurse practitioners and PAs. So also in this kind of um, mix are nurse midwives, this long, you know, thousands of years tradition of nurse midwives. Um, but we have, uh, you have uh, nurse midwives, specialized, you know, nurses. It's a master's degree level training, specialized in giving, you know, in managing the birthing process. Um, I've got a video about nurse midwives for you to watch, I think, in, in, in this module. Um, women, you know, if you have an otherwise healthy pregnancy, a nurse midwife is great, right? And they, they often specialize in doing at-home birth. Um, which to me is a little scary. I, it wasn't a thing we wanted to do, but a lot of people want to do that. And there's some good evidence that it reduces stress and brings a lot of, you know, there's a lot of positives to that, but they also operate in hospitals. Um, you'll see a lot of them in rural areas uh, where it's really hard to get um, OBs. And there are states where, kind of going back to the, you know, the license on the line kind of thing. Um, there are states that, uh, 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 have made it so difficult to practice as an OB that they have almost no OBs practice or, or OBs just quit practicing OB and just become gynecologists because the, um, 
the risk of being sued in that state is so bad. So I think that's like New Jersey is particularly bad for it, Pennsylvania, that area. So it's hard to come by an OB provider. Here's one interesting thing. If you are an OB provider and you deliver a baby, your malpractice insurance has to cover that child until they turn 18. Because at any point until they turn 18, if they develop a condition that can be tied back to the birthing process that you should have noticed and should have managed, you can be held financially liable for that. So, so the, they call it a tail. The tail for your practice lasts 18 years, right? So something you did, you know, 15, 17, 18 years ago can come back to haunt you, you know, uh, uh, long after you've probably delivered another thousand babies or whatever it is. Right? So it's a, it's a, anyway, so, so nurse midwives step in um, uh, where there are holes for care like that. And then also common certified registered, this is what I was trying to pull up in my head, certified registered nurse anesthetist, CRNA. So these are nurse practitioners, you know, essentially they're RNs who go on to get another master, uh, it's a master's level training to do most of what an anesthesiologist can do, right? So a nurse practitioner can do most of what a physician could do, but they don't have the, what they don't have is the underlying science that you, know, you get in a four-year training program and then a three-year residency. So they can do most of what a physician can do, but a physician brings to bear a lot of depth, right? They get a lot of training. And there's a reason they get a lot of training is because they have to go through a problem solving process that is more advanced than a nurse practitioner. You can have very, very good nurse practitioners. You can also have kind of mediocre physicians, right? So there's definitely a range. But if we're comparing average to average, right? The physician's training gives them more ability to kind of see in depth what the problem might be. So CRNAs are commonly used everywhere now. Um, and they, um, so it is likely if you're getting minor surgery uh, that you would have a CRNA passing gas for you. Um, okay, so moving on to, to nurses and we'll stop here on this slide. This is my good friend, Karen Clements. Um, she is the chief nurse for Dartmouth-Hitchcock, the hospital, not the system, but the hospital. Um, and she, uh, she uh, regularly comes down to visit campus and talk to students here. Um, if you're interested in becoming a nurse, she's awesome. And she loves to talk to young people about careers in nursing. So um, hospitals employ nurses, RNs, um, to, um, well, nurses work in a whole range of fields and do a whole range of things. It's really can't just cover it all. But, you know, the hospital-based nurse um, uh, is kind of your baseline. So an RN, registered nurse, you have to pass uh, the NCLEX, it's an exam uh, that says, yep, you've got a certain amount of, of knowledge. Historically, well, you know, as with physicians, the nursing field has evolved over, over you know, the years. And we have, we'll talk more about that later. Um, it's used to be common that you'd get basically an associate's degree, and then you'd pass the, the exam and you'd become an RN. Right, but you'd be in a, uh, a diploma nurse. Then there were these three-year programs, two-year and three-year programs, very often taught at a hospital, um, sort of as an apprenticeship. Much more common today is the BSN, um, and that's the direction that hospitals are, are going toward. Um, all mid-levels have to get their BSN first, uh, then go for advanced training. Um, we also have non-nursing staff, including LPNs and CNAs. Anybody an LNA or a CNA? Just a All right, good. Where do you work? Okay, nursing home. All right, great. Good for you. Great field. All right, I'm going to stop there. We'll we'll pick up with nurses next time.